the book of Leviticus, chapter 22 is where we're going to start off tonight, Leviticus 22. Uh -huh. I'm not preaching verse by verse, and everybody said, Amen. <laughs> I am preaching an overview of the book of Leviticus. Maybe you remember, as we've discussed in covering this in weeks past, the content of the book was delivered to the children of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai over the period of one month. Seems like a long and tedious book when you're reading it in your devotions. It feels like five months, but it's not. And sometimes you can get bogged down in the details and miss the forest through the trees. So we're trying to give you a picture of the forest as we go through the book of Leviticus. As I said, I wanted to avoid this book, but it is impossible to find a better time to preach the book of Leviticus than when you're finishing up the book of Exodus. Because Numbers and Leviticus, or Numbers and Exodus, have this little book in between, and it's essential for the story of what's going on. All right? I'm just going to give you a, a few verses just to kind of whet your appetite, and we'll be seated. We're not going to read a whole lot in the chapters before us. But Leviticus 22.1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children... I'm sorry, speak unto Aaron and his sons that they separate themselves from, uh, from the holy things of the children of Israel and that they profane not my holy name. In those things which they hallow unto me, I am the Lord. Now, I want you to... Uh, in fact, well, let's read the next verse and then, and then we'll go down to the end of the chapter. Verse 3 says, Say unto them, Whosoever he be of all your seed among... Uh, your generations, that goeth unto the holy things, <clears throat> which the children of Israel hallow unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from my pe uh, presence. And here it is again. I am the Lord. All right. Now down to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> he says towards the end on the, in verse 30, on the same day it shall be eaten up, and ye shall leave none of it until the morrow. I am the Lord. Now verse 31. Therefore shall ye keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. Where does God want the attention? <laughs> On himself. That would be very obvious. He said this is what this message is about. I am the Lord. Verse 32. Neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord. Which hallow you that brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God? But just in case you didn't catch it yet, I am the Lord. It appears our worship ought to reflect, wait for it, the Lord. <laughs> the title of the message this evening is Reflection, the Object of True Worship. It might be easier understood the objective of true worship reflection and when i say reflection i don't mean this kind of reflection hmm, let me think on that to a reflection here means like as in a mirror mm -hmm. reflection who do we reflect when we worship we reflect the lord he is the object of our worship and reflection is the objective of worship to reflect the lord let's pray Heavenly Father, I pray that you be with us tonight as we look into your word. Help me in the delivery of this difficult passage. Lord, though it's a lot of tedious content, it has a very simple and clear message. I pray that we come through in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. <coughs> I'm going to spend time reviewing this book and how we got into it just about every time we preach this text so we don't lose sight of the forest through the trees. It's important that we keep this message in context. You get to the end of Exodus, Exodus chapter 40, verse 35. Everything has been made right. The children of Israel have sinned, but they've been forgiven. Then Moses says, I want more than forgiveness. I want your presence. God says, I'll give you my presence. And then Moses says, I want to see you. Oh, it's the coolest part of the book when he, God puts them in the cleft of the rock and passes by. 
But at the end of the whole thing, when all is restored and the tabernacle is ready to be used, it's not used yet because it's used in Leviticus. It's just prepared to be used. And God sets up a meeting with the children of Israel apart from the tabernacle. It's called the tent of meeting at the end of Leviticus. Moses proceeds to return into the presence of God like he had done before. Remember, Moses was the guy who spoke to God face to face as a man speaking with his friend. And so he went in to the uh, tent of meeting to meet once again with the Lord. And this is what happened in the end of Ex Exodus 40, verse 35. It says, and Moses was not able to enter the tent. The glory of the Lord was there. And Moses could not enter. Though it is a sweet, it's not a bitter text, it's a sweet text. There's something off here. Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle. If you were to go to Numbers chapter 1, verse 1, it begins this, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle. Well, now Moses is back into the tabernacle, speaking to God face to face. But in Leviticus chapter 1, it says, And the Lord called Moses unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle. See, Here's the problem. We're not holy. And it's hard for us sinful human beings to wrap our minds around a holy God. <clears throat> and you know what? I'm sure Moses and the rest of the children of Israel would have been completely fine with that setup. They would have said, all right, we can work with this. God, you stay inside the tabernacle, we'll stay out. But that's not the way God operates. And this is amazing to me. It is amazing to me. It ought to be amazing to you. God wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you and me. No matter how many times we sin and mess up and really make a mess of things, God still wants to get things right because he desires a relationship with you many times, not many times, every time more than we desire a relationship with him. He's an amazing God, and he would not leave things the way they were. He's not content to have an estranged relationship. God wants to dwell with his people, so he introduces the book of Leviticus so that we may learn about the holiness of our God. And so that upon learning about who he is, we may then approach back into his presence. Exodus, at the end of the book, the last 40 chapters, or not 40 chapters, but the last half of the book, dealt with uh, the place of worship. That was the tabernacle. There's a lot of chapters in there about the building of the tabernacle, right? But the actual worship in the tabernacle, though it was outlined there, does not take place until Leviticus. So Exodus deals with the place of worship. Leviticus deals with the worship earth. <clears throat> and the themes of Leviticus is holiness. Right. Holiness. That's why we titled the series, Holiness Unto the Lord. This book is about holiness. Pastor, what is the book of Leviticus about? It's about holiness. The holiness of God. It's really what it's about. And so, as, as God begins to lay out this idea of holiness, he does it in sections. Which is why we're preaching it the way we are. Leviticus was written to show the people of Israel the way of life and worship that holiness demands. And there at the foot of Mount Sinai, over the course of a month, God delivered a seven-part treatise on holiness. There's three pairs and the one single pinnacle point. So we started with ritual. You've got in 1 through 7, you have sacrifices. And then you have in 23 through 27, feasts. And both the feasts and the sacrifices come together to picture the rituals of holiness and the whole idea the first section that we talked about is sacrifice is the heart of all true worship okay we're learning about worship this was the second lesson in in uh, in this book uh, of leviticus and we learned this lesson and this lesson still applies today are you ready for it i just gave it to you sacrifice is the heart of all true worship say that with me just so we don't forget Sacrifice is the heart of all true worship. You can read a whole bunch of sacrifices, and you know what? It can go over your head as they do with my, over mine when I'm reading my Bible. But you might walk away at least with this nugget. Sacrifice is at the heart of all true worship. 
you can't worship something you don't sacrifice for. It, it's a truth. If you really think, I don't maybe re-preach that whole message, but it does remind us of 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24, where David, wanting to buy the threshing floor of Mornan, he came, he came and, and he made this statement. He says, Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. He said, because sacrifice, listen, let me summarize the first lesson. Sacrifice is the heart of all true worship. If you and I are going to worship God today, though there are no more sacrifices, thank the Lord, aren't you glad for that? There's no more turtle doves to buy and lambs and all the else that goes with that. And yet, we cannot worship God if we do not gather with a spirit and actions of sacrifice. It's at the heart of all true worship. But there's another section. That section was about the priesthood. And you have chapter uh, uh, 8 through 10 and 22 through 21. And that's uh, what we're going to be covering. Um, oh, actually, we covered sacrifice and then, then priests. The second lesson was this. Reverence is the spirit of true worship. Reverence is the spirit of true worship. <clears throat> Do you think there ought to be reverence when we worship God? Amen. Yeah. Remember when, when Moses approached God? And the first time on Mount Sinai, he saw a burning bush. What did God tell Moses? Take off your shoes. Take off your shoes. The place you're on is holy ground. We lack a spirit of reverence, don't we? I mean, it's missing in our culture today. But wouldn't you agree that <clears throat> reverence is the spirit of all true worship? I, I, man, I, I don't want to re-preach all this, but I do. Uh, but we're going to move on to the third section, because that's where we're at tonight. We've, so we're building blocks up to the pinnacle point of, of, of Leviticus. And we looked at the beginning of the book, and we see a bunch of sacrifice, because sacrifice is at the heart of all true worship. We go towards the end of the book, and we notice that reverence is the spirit of all true worship. That's why they have all the laws about the feast days and this and that, because they're trying to build within the people a spirit of reverence for the worship of God. And now we come to the third section, the heart of sacrifice and the spirit of reverence in our worship will only last as long as God remains the object of our worship, right? It's, it's hard to have reverence and a spirit of sacrifice if you get sidetracked from God and start worshiping something else, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? If, if, if we're teaching Jesus Christ from here, from the pulpit, and then over the course of time, something, I don't know what else would become the, like the center of attention in a, in a church service, but let's say, let's say Jeff. Jeff is like, he, <laughs> Jeff is just an amazing singer. Like, he is like, you didn't realize this, but like uh, Michael Buble, he's got nothing on Jeff. And Jeff starts getting up here, and he starts singing, and it's like, wow. Well, and suddenly people start coming to church to hear Jeff sing. <laughs> it wouldn't take long for reverence to disappear. Because the object of worship would have shifted from God to Jeff. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Well, that'll never happen. So <laughs> there. Stay with me. Stay with me. <laughs> the heart of sacrifice and the spirit of reverence in our worship will only last as long as God remains the object of our worship. And to keep God as the object of our worship, we must remember the third lesson of worship, and that is this. Worship is reflection. Reflection. Talk about sacrifice, talk about reverence. These are terms that define worship. Reflection is this text now. Reflection. Worship is reflection. God is not a reflection of us. We are a reflection of him. We're created in his image. Therefore, when we get together to worship, a holy God. Our worship ought not to be a reflection of us. True worship is a reflection of Him. This is key. There is no worshiping a holy God without understanding the principle of reflection. Worship is reflection. <clears throat> so, 
Stay with me. You can buckle in? Okay. That was like 12 minutes of review, getting us up to gear here, right? Here we are now. We're going to go through like four chapters, five chapters all together, pretty quickly. All right? We're going to begin at the end and go back to uh, chapter 8 because we're covering a section under the priests. In this section, we're going to talk about the priesthood. If you're going to have worship in this context, priests are involved. Their ordination, their qualifications, and how they run the services here is involved in the book of Leviticus. And you need to know why is that there? Why is that important to me? Well, here is why. <clears throat> because we need priests that reflect a holy God. I'm talking about reflection and the role that priests play. If you want to sum it up in a term, it really is reflection, right? Priests are supposed to reflect the holy God. Are you struggling with this thought or you need to dwell on it or chewing on it a bit? <laughs> priests are to reflect a holy God. This is kind of important. If you're going to get up and say you speak for God, I know we're not sinless, but if you're going to fill the role of a priest, you need to live a life that reflects you. At least you know him, right? It is a, it is, it is a quintessential job that deals with reflection. Follow? Capiche, as my dad would say. All right, now, priests that reflect the holy God. You go to chapter 21. And 22, chapter 21 and 22. <clears throat> and we start to see the qualification for a priest. And I, honestly, there's a lot of things in here. I'm glad they are no longer qualifications. <laughs> I would not pass. But there are qualifications for priests, both physical and spiritual. And the conduct of priestly leaders. And, and, and a lot of things is involved in that because God is claiming the totality of the life of a priest. He's saying, you belong to me if you fill this role. And so... The point, that, uh, uh, the point was that the priesthood was not an occupation, but a life that reflected God, not the priest. So you're going to read some pretty strange things in chapter 21 and 22. First of all, to be a priest was to be an ambassador for God. Thus, number one, a priest must refrain from the mourning of funerals because God is not overcome with death. Now, that, I, I, I cried this week. I cried this week at Doug's funeral with his dad. And I was in the hospital this week with uh, Shelly and, and John, and she's ready, she's ready to die. I mean, she's, she's in a rough place. And, and unless the grace of God and the, and the mercy of God come in and provide healing for her body, she probably will not make it. And, 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 and it broke me, and I mourned over this. And I'm glad we're in the dispensation of grace now, because if you were a priest in this time, listen... According to this passage in the beginning of chapter 21, priests had to refrain from mourning at funerals. Why? Because God is not overcome with death. Because when they looked at the priest, they needed to learn something about God because the priest reflected God. And you know, God is not scared of death. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord. That, 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 that Jesus Christ defeated death. He rose again. Death has no, no sting, right? And, and, but for a people who did not know God, they needed to learn by looking at the priest, my God is not afraid of death. And so the priests were not allowed to mourn death. That's strange. It's odd. Unless, of course, you see that they're a reflection of God. And then you keep reading, you learn that priests <clears throat> uh, must be pure in the covenant of marriage because God is pure in his covenants. And they couldn't wear, marry widows and, or prostitutes. And they couldn't uh, marry uh, certain other situations. They're very, very strict on the kind of marriage covenants they made. And they were held and bound to certain laws. <clears throat> uh, and the reason being because God was pure in his covenants. God made no shady deals. God, uh, and that was kind of the idea. You needed to know that the kind of covenant that God made with you and me, though we were the full benefactor of what he decided to do, he didn't make any under-the-table shady deals, and that needed to be reflected in one of the biggest commitments of all, and that was marriage. So priests had to be pure in the covenant of marriage. Priests had to be without blemish. I'd fail. Oh, man, I'm, I'm Italian. I've got things growing all over my face and, and moles, and I'm just it's just my Italian skin. I uh, wouldn't have passed. I mean, they could. You, it's, it's, it's shocking how many physical traits they had to have. 
Uh, they couldn't be crook-backed. You couldn't be a dwarf. Though I don't know if I'd pass that or not. You couldn't be small. <laughs> couldn't be small. I mean, yikes. And, and I mean, there were certain things you couldn't be. You you couldn't have any of these physical things wrong. Why? Because priests must be without blemish because God is without blemish. They had to reflect a holy God. And people had to look at, you couldn't look at a priest, you know, oh, oh, going like this and think, well, God must be pretty weak too. I mean, that, isn't that standard high? Yes. Now again, this is before the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm just trying to show you that worship, regardless of where you think one rule ought to be or not be, you have to conclude that worship is about reflecting a holy God. Yeah. It's not about the personality of the priest. It's not whether you like him or don't like him. Or you're just beautiful to me, priest. It doesn't matter. <laughs> He's a reflection of God. And there were standards for his life that required him to reflect a holy God. Priests had to reflect a holy God. Priests must live pure lives of integrity because God is pure all the time. And at the end of the chapter, it goes into that. And so you make the observation that priests, the facilitators of worship, were a reflection of God, not themselves. Those whom God has called to be spiritual leaders must reflect the holiness of the Lord in all they do and exemplify the faith in the eyes of the people they lead. Because priests are a reflection of a holy God. So you see priests in their, their qualifications. Then you see how sacrifices reflect the holy God. You get into chapter 22. You can read this in your own time. You can read it on your own time, so I don't have to read all the verses. You get into chapter 22, and we begin to see sacrifices. And we see that sacrifices have to represent a holy God. Which means you can't just bring any kind of sacrifice. You couldn't bring a sacrifice with blemishes. Not only could priests not have blemishes, sacrifices could not have blemishes. Well, why? Well, because it wasn't just the priest reflecting God. It was what you brought him that reflected God. I can remember. Men, I'm going to give you some instruction on things not to do. Are you ready? I can remember a couple years uh, uh, had, through, through uh, my childhood where my dad, maybe a bit of a con co uh, uh, procrastinator, Maybe we should pause this so it doesn't get out. But uh, uh, might have been a procrastinator on things like birthdays and uh, Christmas. And there were some times my dad might have, oh, I don't know, forgot to buy my mom a Christmas present. And was scrambling Christmas Eve, driving around with, uh, say, me, looking for a place to shop for mom. And it might have been, I mean, you can't prove this, but it might have been that we went to a 7-Eleven and bought things like a foldable hair dryer and a portable iron, not what you want to buy. <laughs> because Christmas morning is just not the same when what you give to your spouse says, you really didn't mean a whole lot to me. <laughs> Crickets. Yeah, don't do that, man. Don't do that. Okay, why? why? Because what we give kind of reflects the person we give to. And he says, hey, you bring, a blunt, you, you bring an offering to God, a sacrifice, it needs to be without blemish. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is what I just had spare. It has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. Work. There are other things that have things to do with you, right? Mm -hmm. You can talk about your birthday. You can talk about whatever else. But when you talk about worship, it is to reflect the worship of God. And that has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with our God. And so he says, we need, we need even sacrifices without blemish. Why? Because it's a reflection of a holy God. Man, I don't want to get to the conclusion of the message already so soon. But I feel like today, I feel like today, sometimes we worship God with folding bull dryers and travel irons. That's like the best we give God. We tip them. We'll give him a little bit of time here, a little bit of time here. But nothing that reflects who he is. Well, that's just reflecting of what I had in my pocket, okay? He's God. Right. Yeah. And we're not here 
Worth, what? Worship is not a reflection of me. Worship is a reflection of him. <clears throat> so we covered sacrifices. We covered priests that reflect a holy God, sacrifices that reflect a holy God. Look at that. We just preached two chapters in 10 minutes. Be thankful. And now we're moving right along. <clears throat> and we get to representation that reflects the holy God. You get to chapter 8. Now we've got to rewind. Remember, there, there, we're kind of a pyramid building towards the center of the book. So we go back to chapter 8. And we go back to chapter 8 and we learn <clears throat> that if coming to the presence of the Lord <clears throat> calls for sanctification, then going into his presence on behalf of others requires a special sanctity and a distinct calling. So here's the priests. They're getting ready to go before the Lord on behalf of the people. And they're going to represent God. We're about ready to have a service. And so in chapter 8, you have the ordaining of Aaron and his sons and his lineage to serve in the capacity of priests as reflectors of God. And it's very important that the representation they give reflects the holy God. And so you see that priests must be consecrated. They must be qualified and ordained to reflect the holy God. And, oh man, I wish I could take time to get all, uh, all through this. They talk about how the priests need to be washed. They need to be purified from worldly defilement in chapter 8, verse 6. And then they need to be robed properly uh, uh, in order to do so in uh, verses 7 through 9. They need to be anointed in 10 through 13 so that they could be set apart and, and, and with, with a symbolism that said the Holy Spirit is upon them. And they, and they need to have their sins atoned <clears throat> and, and blood must be shed because even the priest is a sinner and must be sanctified before the Lord. And then they're ordained in verses... Uh, 22 through 30, before all the people, and all the people see and recognize they're set apart to represent us before God. <clears throat> That's how they're set up. And it's interesting, get, get down to verse, uh, I think it's uh, verse 30, let's see here, in uh, Leviticus chapter 8, Leviticus chapter 8, uh, gotta get there myself, verse 30, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> <laughs> and Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood, which is upon the altar, and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon his son's garments with him and sanctified Aaron and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. <clears throat> if you were to read previously leading up to this, at this point they took blood and they sprinkled it all over them, but they did more than that earlier in the chapter. They took blood before the full sprinkling, and they took blood and they applied some to the ear. They applied some to the hand, and they applied some <clears throat> to different parts of their body. And the application to the earlobe and to the thumb and to the toe, the application of the blood to these parts covered what they heard and what they handled and where they went, and it meant that all their activities Everything they did was supposed to be set apart by the blood. Everything they did, everything they said, everywhere they went was to be set apart by the blood of Christ. They were to represent God everywhere they went. In other words, let's just sum it up. Let's just sum it up. Here's the idea. In chapter 8, they're ordaining the priests. Man, I remember my ordination. Were any of you here for my ordination? I don't think so. Not too many of you guys left <clears throat> from back in the day. I was so nervous. That's like five hours of being grilled by a panel of pastors. There was like, there was, that's another story. Well, can I have a little rabbit trail here. So there was supposed to be, I handpicked, I think it was like four pastors um, to be on my ordination council. Uh, but uh, more than half of them couldn't make it. So we had a fellowship meeting and my dad just thought, well, let's just invite all the pastors. Well, it's like all the pastors that came early to the fellowship meeting. So there's about 15 men on my ordination council. When you get more than the selected number, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't like multiply in goodness. It just kind of multiplies in how many questions can we come up that nobody else came up with to stump <laughs> the young guy. And so for four to five hours, I was grilled by this panel of 15 pastors trying to answer the questions they could throw at me. I was so nervous by the time I got up that night, I was, I was preaching away, answer some question, and whoop, threw my Bible right onto the auditorium. It was, it was awesome and just went flying out there. You had to be there, sweaty hands. 
bad memory, but I did get ordained. I did get ordained, so I did pass. And that's what's happening in chapter 8. He's before, the priests are before all the people at the end of the chapter, and and all the people see that they've been set apart and set aside, and the blood has been applied to the ear and to the toe and to the thumb to signify that they're not just supposed to be holy on Sundays, but they're supposed to live exemplary, exemplary holy lives because they're going before the Lord, and to reflect a holy God, you've got to live a holy life. And that was the idea. And so they were ordained. And there was no separation between the sacred and the secular. This is the problem. When we compartmentalize God, we, we be Christian on Sunday, but on the rest of the week, we'll watch anything we want to watch. We listen to whatever we want to listen to. We talk any way we want to talk. There's no idea of that in this book. In fact, I think when you get to Peter, there's a, there's a quote from Leviticus that goes something like this. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Right. We ought to have some integrity about the way we live for God from the inside out. <clears throat> Those who lead the congregation know a holy God must be fully consecrated uh, <clears throat> to, uh, consecrated to a holy life. The, let me read that again because I missed it. Those who lead the congregation <clears throat> no, a holy God must be fully consecrated to a holy uh, to a life of holiness. That's what I meant to say. Now, okay, we're doing good. We're only like 29 minutes into it by my clock, right? So we're doing really good. We're blowing through chapters here. Two more chapters to go, and then we're done. We get chapter 9. Chapter 9, here it is. The beginning of ministry. The first public sacrificial meeting here in the tabernacle. Everything's built. Everything's ready. The people have got it ready to go. Chapter 9. We start chapter 9, and it's the first meeting in the tabernacle. The first worship service. It's been talked about and planned for chapters after chapters. From Exodus, talking about the building of the tabernacle and the priest garments and all the instruments, to now in Leviticus. Now we're having the first worship service. It's the first one. It's the first one. And man, it's an exciting time. It must have been wonderful to see the inauguration of this worship service. And it's the beginning of worship under this new Levitical system that has been put in place. And, and as we go through chapter 9, you see a pattern of how to approach God. God is all, all about patterns. And, and he begins with approaching him in stages to represent the pilgrimage from sin and separation through atonement and purification by the blood. And you watch what happens in chapter 9, and you actually do. You can pick out a pattern of how God wants you to approach him. you got to recognize you're a sinner in order to approach a holy God. You can't become, be, come before a holy God unless you know who you are. And so he begins with dealing with sin. And boy, as you're working through the chapter, God's people began to anticipate a meeting with God. Look at verse 6. And Moses said in chapter 9, This is the thing which the Lord commanded that ye should do, and the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. How about that? You worship me this way, and I'm going to appear. Whoa, what a promise that is. And so there's an anticipation. Here are the people, and they say, if we worship right, then God appears in our midst. And so they begin to worship God and reflect who he is. They're reflecting his desires. They're following his worship schedule. They're worshiping his way. I can't say this enough in, in, in enough ways. I, I just, I, my brain is exploding trying to get this idea out. God sets the, 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 the schedule for how we worship him. And he says, do it this way and I'll meet with you. And they did it that way. And you know what happens? Well, God met with them. Because you get down to the end of the chapter. Whoa! In verse uh, 23, and it says this, And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord <laughs> appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed the altar of, uh, of the burnt offering <clears throat> and the fat, <clears throat> which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. I wonder if they shouted for joy and said, Yes! 
or they screamed in fear and fell on their faces. Either way, God kept his promise. They worshiped him the way he laid out. They took the service and they reflected God and God showed up. That's the way it ought to be. I'll never forget that first Sunday that we met at Wooden Valley Baptist Church in the new building after building it. The carpet wasn't even laid. The, 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 the trim wasn't even on. They had just painted, and we, we, we just snuck in to have church in the, in the new building, and, and we began to sing and to worship God. And I'm telling you what, it felt just like that. As we began, it felt like the presence of the Lord came into that service and met with us because we were pursuing the worship of a holy God, and it was the inauguration of our first service in that building. I'll never forget that day as a teenager. But you don't have to wait for new buildings. You could even be in the basement of a church building, I suppose, and meet with a holy God if you approach him with this thought, I'm here to reflect him. It's not about me. I may need stuff. How many need stuff? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I'm here. I, I, need, I need church. I need God. I need you. I need fellowship. No doubt about it. I come loaded with needs. But I'm not here for me. I'm here to worship a holy God. And he says, when you approach me the way I desire, I will meet with you. And he did. Oh, man, we could spend some time on that. It was awesome. They shouted for joy. And by the way, you can always tell when people have met with God because they fell on their faces. It bothers me. I, I, and I, I, don't want to, I don't want to offend the Holy Spirit, and I don't want to get on a rabbit trail, but it seems off, awfully odd. Ah, blah, can't talk. It seems awfully odd to me how some people express being in the presence of God when it turns into a party. You know what I'm saying? Where, where suddenly the atmosphere and the vibe is all about how I feel when every time the people of God ever came into the presence of God, by the way, not just in the Old Testament, but all the way into the future revelation, when we're all in heaven, there's one thing we do in the presence of God. We fall on our faces and we worship him. It's one of the quintessential signs of being in his presence. That humility of spirit that recognizes who I am compared to who he is. It is the Isaiah 6 experience where you say, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am, at, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's always the same. When we come into the presence of God, we are overcome with the reality of who we are in His presence and filled with with humility in being in that moment. They bowed on their faces. Wouldn't it be good just to end right now? I guess it'd be shorter. Well, it's a little <laughs> bit longer. And it'd be good to end right here. And we would have concluded this point of reflection. Because worship is not just sacrifice, as we covered in lesson one. Worship is not just reverence. You must have reverence. But worship is also reflection. But there is a story here, and there are so very few, very, very, very few narrative stories in the book of Leviticus. It might be good to read the next few verses of chapter 10. And we will be done shortly. The Bible says, And Nadab, in chapter 10, verse 1, read it with me for this long. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. 
and Aaron, Aaron the dad, Aaron held his peace. Whoa. What a strange fire. Well, I don't know. Because it doesn't say. But the context, strange, doesn't mean like, ooh, that's strange. It means strange as indifferent than what was prescribed. <clears throat> well, why did they do that? You know why? They chose a style of worship that reflected themselves. I want you to think about this. Walk through this with me, just, just for a moment. <clears throat> Why did they alter the procedures of worship? <clears throat> what was their motivation? Nadab and Abihu. They altered the procedures of worship. We can all agree to that. There's, I mean, it's clear. They offered strange fire. They offered something different than what was prescribed. Why? Easier. Maybe it was easier. Or blending other other cultural worships. Yeah. You guys are thinking. Your your wheels are spinning because it's a really good question. Why? Why? What was it? Was it ignorance? I doubt it was ignorance. <laughs> Because God just spent a month giving instructions on how to do it, and he just finished teaching them how to do it, and they just had a worship service, and the Holy God came down among them right before this service. Okay, so I doubt they can claim ignorance. It's not like, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't clear on what the instructions were. I mean, come on now. It takes us, you know, months getting through the book of Leviticus in our, in our Bible reading. It wasn't like this was a passing comment. God was very clear on how to do it. That, that wasn't ignorance. And that's not why they changed the procedures. Convenience? Was it a matter of difficulty? Well, you got to think about that. I think it might have actually been harder to come up with something different than what was already provided. I mean, it was already there. All the tools, all the instruments... All the procedure was in order. It's right there. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line, right? And, and this procedure is like a straight line. God says, do it this way. So they said, we're going to do it this way. Well, I, doubt you can claim, I doubt you can claim convenience. And it wasn't difficulty because I, I don't, don't make me take the time to express how God made it plain, but God made sure all the people supplied everything they needed to perform worship. In fact, to the point where, remember remember Moses, like, stop bringing me stuff. We've got enough. <laughs> it wasn't difficulty. It wasn't like, well, what do we do? We can't worship God the way he prescribed because they ran out of the stuff at the store. So we're going to do it a different way. No, no, it wasn't. You know why? It was worship to reflect themselves. Do you know why they chose something different? Because they wanted something to reflect the way I worship. God says do it this way. I can't claim ignorance. I know he said to do it. And it's, it's not because it's more convenient, but it's kind of like, oh, say the first act of worship recorded by two brothers in Genesis, Cain and Abel. And God says, bring me a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice. Abel did. That reflected what God wanted. Well, what did Cain bring? He brought fruit of his garden because it reflected how good of a gardener he was. He said, look at, look at what I've done. It's pretty awesome. And God rejected it then too. But Nadab and Abihu said, no, look, here's what I want. We can, we can orchestrate a worship service that will reflect our style. And, you know, you can't really blame them because there are a lot of priests. <laughs> How many ever read uh, The Far Side? Anybody ever? Is it, am I too old? Is nobody going to die? Yeah, I remember The Far Side, and I think you do too. He was the best. He was awesome. And there was this one fireside joke. There's this uh, penguin in a sea of penguins, and you can see him. He's standing up, and he says, I just got to be me. And he's standing there, and he looks like everybody else. 
for thousands of miles around and says, I just got to be me. We can imagine if you're a priest, you, you, gotta, you can't wear what you want to work. You can't express yourself in your clothing. That's prescribed. Right? You, you have a very strict schedule and regiment. You're going to follow a certain thing. How do you exactly differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself in the service of the Lord in this way? Well, they thought, what if we use strange fire? People will be like, ooh, nice fire, Nadab. Where'd you get that? <laughs> and so they chose, I don't know exactly what it is, but they chose a manner of worship to reflect me. And God took their life. And God said to his own dead, you're not even allowed to mourn their death because they disobeyed me. I wonder if that communicates that God takes worship seriously. You know, this is the book of Leviticus. The message is done. We're at the conclusion now. And we look at this and think, man, what is, why are we in the book of Leviticus? Oh, I can't wait till we get through the series. <clears throat> uh, no, look, me too. I, I, I've been thinking that way too. Can I say that's wrong? Would it be fair to say that many, if not most, well-meaning Christians today treat worship as a way of expressing and reflecting themselves to God? I think most Christians do today. That worship and, and, and praise and worship are different, understand. But men, I'd say many, if not most, Christians feel that worship is a way to express myself to God. I'm not saying they have wicked intentions. I'm not saying that Christians are, you know, oh, wicked. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying maybe out of just complete ignorance, we have this idea that we need to craft a worship service that reflects the way we want to worship God. Would you say, would you agree with me, uh, again, that many, if not most, well-meaning Christians today treat worship as a way of expressing and reflecting themselves to God? Yeah. I think I would. Would it be fair to say that most Christians do not recognize that you cannot worship a holy God unless you reflect Him? I, I'd say most Christians don't recognize that. The absurdity of worshiping God to reflect me <laughs> misses us because we have accepted the cultural mandate that culture gets to dictate how we reflect Him. If you if we went to a, if we went to a birthday party, if it was my wife's birthday and I'm going to celebrate my wife's birthday. I said, babe, I really love y'all. I want to celebrate your birthday. We're going to have peas for dinner. Peas. I haven't had peas cooked by my wife maybe once or twice in 18 years of marriage. Because she doesn't like peas. But I love them. Does anybody else love peas? With but Some of you hate them. But smushed with some butter on them. Oh, I love peas. But for me to do that for her doesn't really reflect her or how how would you think if if at um uh doug's dad's funeral last week if doug got up and his turn to speak about his dad talked about himself that would be odd at a funeral to remember the life of someone else and you make yourself the center of attention and yet we worship god the same Maybe unintentionally. But sometimes we even choose our churches by this. Are you ready? Well, I don't really like your style of worship. I am really more into this style. Wait a second. I thought it, I thought it wasn't about us. I thought it was about our holy God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how are we supposed to learn God's mind on reflecting him in worship? Believe it or not, you and I need the book of Leviticus.
as thick as it is. As thick as it is. When you let, let me let me end with this thought. You know David. I love David. I, I love this writing. You do too. David said in Psalm 118, Open now mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. He said this. He said in verse 97 of Psalm 119, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. He said in, in 165, verse 165, Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. Now think about how amazing that statement is. When we say we love the law of God, we're referring to the Bible as we know it today, right? When I read what David said, oh, I love thy law, you know what I say? I do too, David. I say the same. Oh, I love thy law. I meditated all day long, or however he said that, right? Uh, Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. I think the same thing, David. And you know what I think of when I think of the law? I think of pretty much what David wrote. Or the New Testament. But think about what David had when he wrote those words. There was no New Testament. There were no minor or major prophets. He was the author of most of the Psalms and some of the Proverbs. He wasn't writing about Psalms and Proverbs. Yeah, but what about those books that came after, after the first five books of the law, the Torah? Well, those are like the kings. And, and guess who was the most prominent king in the book of Kings? It was David. <laughs> So those books were being written when David had these thoughts. David wasn't reading from the kings. You know what that leaves? When he says, oh, I love thy law, he's talking about Leviticus and Deuteronomy. He loved the Pentateuch. He loved, he loved this book. And some of us come to church and think, I don't even want to come Sunday night because pastors. And you're here, so clearly it's not you, right? <laughs> I don't even want to come Sunday night because pastors teaching on Leviticus. I don't like to I get through Leviticus. Wait a second. David says, Oh, how I love thy law. Right. Thy law. What was it? Listen, what was it about the law that made David think that way? Why did he say that he loved Levitical law? What did he love about it? What were the wondrous things in God's law? And how does God's law bring great peace? Well, it was what the law taught him about his holy God. <clears throat> like what? Things like, if I'm going to worship him, I need to reflect him. Do you know why it's important to know God this way? Because it would be hell on earth to try to worship a God you didn't know. I was in Haiti, lived there for two and a half months after I got back. <clears throat> An earthquake took place in Haiti, a major earthquake. You may, might have remembered that years ago. And I remember watching some interviews on CNN, I think it was. They sent some reporters over, and they were interviewing some of the local religious leaders in Haiti. And they have a very weird, it is a, it is a, it is a, blend of Catholicism and Voodooism, and they have blended into a hybrid kind of religion. And this earthquake had devastated everything. And one of uh, the reporters came and asked one of their priests, have you called upon your God for help? And he says, no, we would never call upon our God during a time of such vulnerability because we don't know what he might do to us. Do you know why we need the law? We need the law so we can know how God thinks. We can know how he wants to be worshipped. We can know what he expects from us. And David says, knowing that gives me peace. I don't have to guess at who he is or what he expects in my life. I can know him. I can know that I know him because he wrote it down for us. Friend, with every head bowed, and everybody closed. You need the law. So do I. And we need to know this truth tonight from this text. That worship is a reflection of our holy God. It's not a reflection of us. So maybe the application tonight then is how well does your life reflect God? Heavenly Father.